I want to give sort of a high level talk here and talk about the future of interactive technology. Uh, pretty broad topic. Uh, but my first ta thought when I sit down and think about what is the future of interactive technology is, well, it has changed some over the years that I've been looking at this. Um, some of the past futures that we have had have arrived. Uh, so we sort of see the precursor to Zoom here, and boy, has that arrived in the last few years. And that sort of looks a lot like a Roomba, and this is already on my wrist. So some of these things have definitely, that we wanted to see, have definitely arrived. Some, not so much. We do not have jetpacks or flying cars. We don't have much in the way of monorails, and certainly not this sort of cantilevered over the road thing that I, it seems to serve no purpose. Uh, or dome cities, and I don't know what that kid was supposed to do, but we don't have that. <laughs> um, but something that did arrive, Mark Weiser had a vision uh, of ubiquitous computing, where computing could be sort of all over um, our lives uh, and everywhere. And that vision has really served us phenomenally well. It's been uh, tremendously insightful. We now live in the uh, world where computing is really uh, accessible everywhere, right? 80% of Americans walk around every day with a globally connected supercomputer in their pocket, okay? And you can't really get a whole lot more ubiquitous. Well, you certainly can get more ubiquitous. I'm gonna talk about that. Um, but that's very ubiquitous, okay? It's not exactly what Weiser's vision was, but it is definitely ubiquitous. Okay. On the other hand, uh, as revolutionary as that was and as well as it has served us, uh, in many respects that vision was about taking the computing that existed uh, and still exists and moving uh, the interactive systems that were there out into the world. Okay. But I would say we need to now move beyond that. Uh, we really need to think harder about what interactions need to be like out there in the world. Okay, and what they need to look like given that we have a lot different technology than we did. All right. So today I'm gonna to take a little slice out of this very big and hard topic. I, and really what I wanna do is to suggest some ways in which I think you should be thinking a little bit differently as an HCI researcher about the future than we have thought about the future in the past. All right. So I'm not gonna try to be in any way comprehensive and I am surely not gonna try to make any predictions about where the future is gonna be. That is a fool's errand, you should just not even try. Um, well, maybe you should, but, <laughs> uh, but I am gonna focus on a few things. I am gonna talk about some new approaches to old problems and I am gonna talk about some old approaches to new problems, all right? And I'm just gonna pick three exemplars, uh, and you'll excuse me if I choose exemplars out of my own work, I understand it the best. <laughs> um, these include some key properties of people uh, and of sensors and the systems we all use today. Uh, and that's gonna end up talking about uncertainty in the interface. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about even more ubiquity. Uh, and here I want to say that we want to think about making it uh, even cheaper and more lightweight, smaller, inexpensive than we have in a pretty dramatic sense. And then I want to talk about going beyond sort of colonizing the world. That's one way to see Weiser's vision is colonizing the world, the real world with computing, with the computational world. And I want to go to making the world, actually creating that whole world. All right, but before we do that, I feel like uh, for any talk about the future of technology, we really need to talk about the elephant in the room uh, that is always there, okay? And the biggest change I will, or I'm sorry, the biggest agent of change uh, for us, I think, uh, has actually changed remarkably little. Uh, and that is the exponential growth of computing that is described by Moore's Law. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about Moore's Law in a very schematic way, so you'll notice I very carefully labeled one axis here as good stuff resulting from transistors. I don't know what the, I don't know what the units on that are, and I've carefully not labeled time, and in fact, that's not an exponential curve at all. It's an ellipse, because it's easy to draw in PowerPoint. <coughs> But, okay, but wait, <laughs> you're probably saying clock speed stopped doubling a long time ago, quite a long time ago. 
Isn't Moore's Law dead? Well, no, Moore's Law is not dead. <laughs> it has been predicted to die any second now for many, many years, most of my lifetime. But in fact, it goes back further in time than we think, and it continues forward. But there are definite limitations coming along these days. First off, it's much harder to use the computational power than it used to be. Okay, uh, so the top seven points in this chart are all NVIDIA C GPUs. Okay, and that's a lot harder to get the computation out of that and doing the work that you need it to do for your problem than it is sort of conventional architectures, let's say. But even if we take that out, those GPUs out of the picture, uh, it's still going on. And by the way, these, the, to be clear, these charts have a logarithmic scale on the y-axis, so this seemingly linear uh, increase here is actually exponential. So even without GPUs, these are all conventional CPUs. This chart's starting to get a little bit old, but it's pretty close to what's happening now. We're, it's still going on, okay? But the doubling rate is probably going to get wider, longer. It's been doubling at two years. It's probably gonna be longer. It's gonna be less, less consistent. It's not gonna be so clock step. Uh, as it has been, okay? It's gonna be less predictable, but it is still happening, all right? And so what I like to say is Moore's Law is dead, long live Moore's Law. All right, now, I know what you're thinking. It's like, why are you telling me this? I have known about Moore's Law since I was 12 years old. Why, do you, why are you telling me about this? Okay, I am here today to try to convince you that you do not understand Moore's Law, okay? And it really does matter. Um, and you should be thinking about it a lot more as an HCI researcher, as somebody who's building technology for people to use. I think we need to think a lot more about Moore's Law and more about the computational power than we have, okay? And the reason for that I will say you don't understand Moore's Law is because it is very difficult as human beings to understand exponential growth. It's just, it's nearly impossible, it seems to me. Every time I think I understand it, I realize I don't. <laughs> Okay, and that will come up in the talk in a bit here, okay? And so I wanna give you two thought experiments to help you understand this exponential growth um, that is described by Moore's Law. All right, first one, first thought experiment number one. All right, think about all the computational, in, increase in computational power that we've had since you can pick a date, but I'll pick 1965, and maybe this is what computing looked like in about 1965, very different than today. That's a machine that fills a good part of a room, which is vastly overpowered by my watch. Okay, so think about just how much increase, there's been this tremendous explosion of increased computational power. Hold in your head a second how much increase that is. All right, well, what does it mean to double every two years? It means all of that increase, every single bit of it happens again in the next two years, all of it. All of that increase happens again. That's what doubling means. And this is why we can't understand exponential increases. Okay, that is huge. Okay, every single bit of those gains are gonna happen in the next two years. Every single bit are gonna happen before sophomores in this room graduate. Okay, all of that change is gonna happen again. All right, it's all gonna happen for the professors before your next SNSF grant expires. <laughs> okay, should you ever get one. Uh, <laughs> at least I've been struggling with that. <laughs> um, all right, thought experiment number two. Now this thought experiment comes from Douglas Engelbart. I saw him deliver it at one point. It's a great experiment. Suppose you and everything in this room, so we can't really see outside this room, that's great for this experiment. Uh, suppose you and everything in the room here suddenly got 10 times bigger. Could you tell the difference? All right, how many people think you can tell, you could not tell the difference? I think that's kind of the common sense answer is you couldn't quite tell the difference. That turns out to be the right answer, but for not the reason that you think, okay. So well, let's think about this a little bit. Um, let's see how our chair is situated here. We have two legs, okay. Um, well, first off, mass scales by volume, but the strength of the chair that you're sitting in now scales by the cross-sectional area of those posts that are holding you up, those two posts. And so suddenly you have 10 times the amount of weight proportionally, you weigh essentially a ton, and those chairs are not designed for that. 
and the chair is going to collapse under that weight, and you might notice that, okay? All right. So the chair will collapse under the 10x weight, but in fact, uh, you're probably going to be distracted. You're not going to notice that because most of your bones are going to break for exactly the same reason, okay? And you will, you will probably notice that, okay? Except not really, uh, because oxygen consumption of cells scales by volume, but their ability to absorb it scales by area. You just lost 90% of your oxygen to your brain. You will be unconscious before you hit the floor and dead shortly thereafter, so no, you won't notice. <laughs> okay, but not for the reason that you thought. <laughs> All right. So the moral of the story here is that large, and in this case, this is an order of magnitude change, but if you think about things doubling, we're talking about a lot more than a more, or more ugh, order of magnitude change. Order of magnitude and large, or larger changes have a huge impact on things, and they in particular have a big impact when we have differential scaling, which is exactly what we've got. We've got sort of raw computing power on this end that is scaling very, very rapidly, exponentially. And we've got the important part of the system and the complicated part of the system, the human beings down here, which proportionally just aren't scaling at all, aren't changing, and everything in between there. So we have a huge amount of differential scaling. And this thought experiment is really to make you realize that when you have big differential scaling, it has huge impacts on things. All right. Now, by the way, just how much computing power do we have right now? Because I think we lose track of this. So, um, see, last time I did this, I looked this up in the latest uh, NVIDIA architecture. Um, we're talking about 76 billion transistors on each chip, okay? And billion is a number that's a little hard, like exponential, is a little hard to get your head around. So let's talk about that a little bit. First off, it's getting kind of hard to measure these days um, because you've got so many, and you now have a bunch of different core types. But I think we likely have about 100 trillion, so we've just bounced up by another factor of 1,000 floating point operations per second at peak speeds for a single GPU. And these are devices that you can buy off the shelf, stuff into your PC. These are not uh, anything sort of fancy or in a research lab somewhere. Okay, and to give you an idea of how big that is, that comes out to roughly 1,100 floating point operations per second for every single neuron in your brain. All right. So it should beg the question of like, can I simulate a neuron with 1,100 floating point operations per second? I think you probably can, <laughs> but different talk. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, also in this architecture, we have uh, 18,000 separate cores, or they're not all independent. Some of them have, chunks of them have to be executing the same instruction. But as a comparison, all of this started out with microcontrollers, or I'm sorry, microcomputers, and the original uh, microcomputer had 2,300 transistors in it. So we have many, we have an order of magnitude more cores, and there's at least an ALU in each one of those, than we had transistors in, where we, in the um, microcomputer that kind of, we feel like, started all of this. All right, so that is a huge amount of computing power. But the really interesting thing about exponential growth and about uh, Moore's Law is that nothing has happened yet. <laughs> Okay, we feel like there's been all this technological change in the last few years and things have just been exploding. Nothing has happened yet because we are here. We are not way up here, we are here at the beginning. Uh, and that's an implication of exponential growth, okay? If you think about, I said in two years we're gonna see all of that change that I said was there or that you thought about was there since 1965 again. In four years, we're gonna have seen three times that much, and so forth and so on, okay? And so the change that we've seen recently, or seems like recently, that seems like it's just exploding, nothing. Uh, it's just a drop in the bucket compared to what we're going to see uh, as things continue on. Okay, so hopefully that gives you an idea that maybe we have a lot of raw material to work with and we can expect a lot more raw material in the future. So what are we gonna do with that from an HCI perspective? How are we gonna serve people for this? 
Okay, and here I'm just gonna throw out some possible, a few possible exemplars, and I'll basically start setting up the first one here. Um, here's some ideas of things we might do. These are not at all new ideas or original to me. One is sensors, sensors, and more sensors, and let's use machine learning to derive the context of interaction so that we know what the user uh, is doing and we can respond appropriately and we can provide value for that. Okay, we see a lot of that out in the world. Uh, another one is let's do natural interaction, so gesture and speech and other things that we do in human-to-human -human communication to make our um, interaction with uh, our machines more natural. Okay, well, what do those things have in common? All right. Uh, something they have in common is uncertainty. And this is something they have in common that we are, is not in common with our previous work. Okay, and uncertainty, so now we don't know exactly what we've got, okay? We don't know that the sensors are accurate. We definitely don't know that the machine learning models have definitely delivered the truth. They're getting much and much, much, much better, but they're, you know, you think about it, 95% accuracy, you're still missing one in 20, getting it wrong. Okay, if you think about what we know about how to handle input, if it was the case that, you know, I was told my system reported an event that the left mouse button went down, but one out of 20, it didn't really, that would make building interfaces really hard. But that is what we are dealing with uh, when we introduce uncertainty. And in fact, all of what we know, not all of what we know, but almost all of what we know in the structure that we have built for handling inputs is really uh, implicitly assuming that the inputs actually happened as they deliver and were delivered. And if that's not true, then all sorts of bad things start to happen. Uh, and so this uncertainty is a, is a real problem, and it's been a real problem for quite a long time. Okay, and so this brings me to my exemplar number one uh, that I wanna talk about, which is handling uncertain interaction, okay? Now, for me, this is an old problem. It's a very, it's still a completely timely problem, I think, but I've been trying to work on this problem for more than 30 years uh, across three, uh, three PhD students. Uh, great work over 30 years. Um, but we somewhat recently, uh, well, I guess 2014 is somewhat recently, <laughs> um, a new, we finally sort of got to uh, my feeling that we had made some significant progress on this uh, problem. And basically, Julia Schwartz here, uh, building on, on my uh, other students, Jen Mankoff, and then before that, Gary Newell, um, was able to sort of essentially crack this or at least provide a, a big move forward by using a massive amount of computing power. Well, we'll see if it's really massive in a minute, but I, I, let's call it massive for a minute, okay? So what did she do? Um, well, what she ended up doing was to use Monte Carlo representations of the interface and a particle filtering approach to consider um, multiple alternatives. Now, if you think about inputs, or you think about uncertainty in interaction, you have uncertainty in the input. You don't know what you have, so you wanna think about a probability distribution over the possible inputs that maybe this really was. And that's gonna induce uh, probability distribution over states of the interface, okay? And so what we're really gonna do is, or what Julia uh, did was to run n copies, as many as you need, of the interface. So now each of these copies is represented by internally by an interactor tree, if you know how interfaces are uh, uh, implemented internally. Uh, and each copy of that, each copy of that interface tree represents one possible state of the interface and we have a collection of them. We can use that collection as an approximation uh, to the probability distribution over the possible states that have been induced by the possible states of the uh, input. Okay, so each copy is a sample um, of a possible state in a very high dimensional uh, state space of interfaces, okay? All right, so together, uh, these samples approximate this large probability distribution, uh, and it is the probability distribution of probable a probability of states that have been induced by the probability that we saw particular inputs, okay? All right, well, this is unfortunately the part of the talk where I have to do true confessions. 
which is I don't understand Moore's law either. Okay, Julia cracked this by doing something that I characterized at the time as crazy. I told her not to do it. In fact, she implemented a whole system at, under my advice that didn't take this approach at all, and it didn't. It worked okay, but it wasn't that great. Um, eventually, she stopped listening to me, <laughs> but I was, I was telling her. We will need thousands of copies of interfaces, I said. There's N copies that were going on. And this will never be practical, I said. Don't do this, I said. Well, she implemented it on her mobile phone and it worked just fine. So yeah, I don't understand Moore's law either. <laughs> um, why is it that this is okay? Uh, why doesn't this combinatorically explode? Well, particle filtering is designed to keep the particles under control, but you still think you're gonna need thousands of these. But that's fine, okay? If you think about it, uh, the structures that we use for implementing graphical user interfaces today were invented in the early 80s. They worked great on the machines at that time. We now have over 200,000 times more computational power, more memory, more of everything than we had at that time. So if we need 20,000 copies of the interface, it's just a drop in the bucket. Okay, no problem. <laughs> we can do that. So that's why <laughs> we need to pay attention to this. And then it turns out you don't need thousands of copies. And this is not something that we understood or learned until we implemented it. But uh, you don't need thousands of samples. You might need 100 samples. You probably don't. Usually you need tens of samples. Julia said, I'm going to cap this at 10 samples. And it worked fine for the demo that I'll show in a minute. Okay, why is that? This is a very high dimensional space. How can we possibly sample it? Well, the reason is that the high dimensionality here um, the dimensions are in just not at all independent of each other. And if you think about what the user's doing, uh, there's only probably three or four, maybe five, but usually three or four things that the user might be trying to do at any given time. So you don't need that many samples to really represent that. And the truth of the matter is if there's 100 things that they might be trying to do right now, what should be the system's response? Well, the system needs to say, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> Okay, and so mostly it's just gonna throw up its hands at that point, and we're never gonna get to thousands uh, as, an, as a necessity um, for modeling this. So it turns out that we could have afforded to do tens of thousands of interfaces, we only need to do 10, okay? But we never got, we would have never gotten there to understand that point if uh, Julia had listened to me. <laughs> um, okay, so the moral of the story is do what I, no wait, that's not right. Um, the moral of the story is that the siren song of efficiency that comes from our computer science intuitions, and we all have these intuitions. I, when I sit down and write code, it's like I never write inefficient code. I always think right there about, okay, let, what's the efficient way to do this? What's the efficient way to do that? Those in intuitions are coming to us from the past, from a long time ago. Okay, and some of them are still perfectly valid, but some of them are not as much as we think, okay? And the siren song of those instincts is strong. And uh, as HCI researchers, I think a lot of the time we need to work hard to overcome those. And that was part of the, the real reason I wanted to uh, talk a bit about Moore's Law up front, or part of the reason. Okay, now, by the way, what are we gonna do with these probability distributions that uh, Julia built here? Well, the original aims of my work back in the 90s was to do things like accurately track and reason about the alternatives, the uncertain set of alternatives that might be there. Okay, to be able to make informed judgments about what is happening, but under uncertainty. Okay, and a probability distribution is gonna help you a lot with that. You have some notion of, well, yeah, these two things these two things are possible or probable right now, but one of them is way more probable than the other. You're gonna do one thing, but if it's like, this is just barely more probable than the other, uh, maybe you're gonna to need to act differently. Okay, and so those probability distributions are very important. Okay, and in particular, we don't wanna let uh, recognition errors that happen early uh, break our interactions. Uh, and this is a lot of what happens with uncertain systems is you have to act on the basis of what you've got and you gotta make early decisions. And if there's one 
uh, recognition error early, it can basically take you straight off into the weeds and things crash, okay? And you need to defer those kinds of decisions until you have enough information and know when you have less uncertainty, you have enough uh, or you have a uh, low enough uncertainty to be able to act uh, appropriately. Okay, and then we also want to be able to provide feedback to the user about the uncertainty that the system has. The user is probably not uncertain at all. They know what they're doing. The system doesn't know, but being able to somehow feed back to the user that I, the system doesn't get what you're doing right now is in, immensely valuable in this setting. And again, uh, we need some uh, model of the uncertainty to do that. Probability distributions are good. All right, so let me show you a little video. Um, which is a demo of uh, sort of the end product here. Ah, there we go. Consider this touch diagramming tool inspired by Igarashi's interactive beautification. Now I'm actually gonna stop this for a second. So there's something missing here. This is a fairly conventional drawing tool. As you'll see, you can draw lines and, and primitives and it's gonna do a little of straightening up here. But what's missing in this picture? There's no palette. There's no set of operators here. You just do it, okay? You just draw the thing that you want out there. And, but that drawing is gonna be very ambiguous. When you start the drawing, you can't tell if you're drawing a circle or a square or a line. All right. Users add shapes to the canvas by dragging out a bounding region. Multiple shapes are possible. The application guesses the most likely shape based on past actions. When the user hesitates, the application shows an embest list highlighting changes. The user may then select an alternative by tapping on it. Shapes and lines may be dragged. When an item is being dragged, a trash can appears at the bottom of the screen. Dragging to this area removes the item. Of course, if the user just wants to put the item at the bottom of the screen, she can select this alternative as well. In addition to being dragged, shapes can also be resized. When adjusting lines, endpoints snap to targets. Here is a demonstration of the features of this application. Such an application would be very difficult to implement in a conventional interface framework. With our framework, both the tracking of interface alternatives and the rendering of these alternatives to communicate uncertainty are handled by the system. Interface developers only need to worry about specifying the operational logic of interactors and about rendering a single alternative to the screen. Okay, now that last bit is really important as well. So as a programmer of this system, you don't really think much about uncertainty at all. There's a tiny little bit of things that you need to add to this. Mostly you write the one interface that is based on a certain pos you know, on certain input. We run multiple copies of it and combine things back together. But as a programmer, you don't have to think about that. You just write the interface like you would have written it as if there was not uncertain input. So that's also very important as a result here. Ah, no, no, no. <laughs> all right. There we go. Now, what else could we possibly do uh, when we've got probability distribution? So there's a bunch of other stuff we can do, but there are some future possibilities I wanna talk about as well. So maybe there's a PhD number four somewhere down there. Uh, these have been about 20 years apart and we're probably not gonna get to get down to number four, but maybe. All right, one thing we could do is zero latency interfaces. Okay, cut latency down to nothing. How do we do that? Well, if we have a probability distribution of what's going on, maybe we can figure out the three to five most thing, or three to 10, it says here, most things, most probable things, and just go out and compute the results that we do in some sort of reversible fashion for each of those and have them ready, and they're sitting there, and as soon as we get far enough in that we know what the user wants and they have told us what they want, boom, it's there, no latency. Okay, and in fact, we can turn that dial a little further, and we can do, negative latency interfaces, okay? We can know before the user tells us what they wanna do, what they wanna do uh, with, with some probability. Uh, and if we were to provide appropriate interaction techniques, now this is gonna require definitely some new interaction techniques um, uh, to do this, but if we can do appropriate interaction techniques, we can uh, provide things faster um, and get things done uh, with essentially negative latency which is an interesting concept. Okay, so I said we're gonna do three exemplars, let's move to number two. Can we be even more ubiquitous than we are today, okay? And I think at this next level, um, 
a lot of at least simple ubiquitous tests are going to need devices which are almost disposable. I kind of don't want disposable devices, I want recyclable devices, but let's think about disposable like we would think about disposing of a piece of paper because that's how we're gonna do it. Okay, can we make it paper-like? Can we make interactive, useful interactive devices for 20 cents, let's say? Okay, not tens of dollars, not hundreds of dollars, 20 cents, can we do that? And of course I'm gonna say the answer is yeah, we can do that. Um, so we can do computation at this price point. In case you missed it, these days you can buy a microcontroller for three cents. You have to buy them in quantity of 100, but why wouldn't you? <laughs> okay. Um, so yes, we can provide computation, but that's not gonna, that seemed like you know, one of the big hurdles to getting under 20 cents, but not anymore. All right, but we need to remember that Moore's Law is great, but not everything scales uh, the way Moore's Law does, the way transistors have scaled. And in particular, we, I think we all know batteries do not scale uh, in that way. They've been scaling much more linearly. Okay, and so it's not the computation, it's not having a computer anymore that's the problem, it's power, okay. But it turns out that there are some interesting corollaries to Moore's Law, um, and several of these, uh, Josh Smith at the University of Washington who did a bunch of, has done and is doing a bunch of good work in this area taught me. Uh, and one of them is that smaller transistors are also reducing power, they're lower power. Um, and so our power consumption is going down very rapidly. Um, so can we go without batteries, because either supplying the batteries or running the wire to the wall or changing the batteries is not gonna work for 20 cent devices. They're not gonna work for being way more ubiquitous than we are. This is not a new observation. Um, can we go without power in the device at all? Okay, and the answer is fairly straightforward. Uh, you can think about, is it possible? Because yeah, we're already doing this. Uh, you already have this, you're carrying with you now uh, cards that have in them RFID tags. And these tags don't have uh, power in them, but they have a little bit of computation. Um, and it turns out, uh, as we'll see in just a second, we can turn these into interactive devices, okay? And this is a very widely deployed, as I say, you all have one or more of these with you. I have several in my wallet and my credit cards uh, and my ID to get me in the door and things like that. Um, now these are relying on an external power support source. There's a reader which is supplying RF energy through the air just enough to get us over uh, the threshold to be able to power a little bit of electronics and to be able to commu and not importantly communicate back and forth, okay? But we could also possibly think uh, that we could do this without any external power at all uh, by doing ambient backscatter signaling techniques. So there's RF energy coming uh, through this space constantly, uh, probably from all our phones, if nothing else, Wi-Fi, TV, radio, uh, there's a small bit of power there and you can pull out a small bit of that power. Nah, probably not enough. Well, there in case, some cases it's enough to actually run a computation, but we don't necessarily need to do that. What we can think about for these uh, kinds of devices is using the mechanical manipulation of the device to manipulate the properties of an antenna that changes the way it absorbs or reflects, backscatters, uh, ambient uh, radio frequency information that's already there, and then read that at a distance, okay? So it's possible that we can do things without, uh, interesting devices without having any uh, power on the device at all, or even power in an external reader. Well, you're gonna need a little bit in the receiver, I guess. Um, okay. So can we do this? Um, so again, a couple of uh, now re very recently graduated PhD students have been working on some of parts of this. Um, and uh, again, to look at interactive devices where the user's action, the mechanical action of the user reconfigures an antenna, in this case an antenna that is literally printed on paper. Uh, and we connect or disconnect elements of that uh, antenna, for example, okay? So then that opens up in, uh, a bunch of interesting questions of how, 
How do we make these? How do we interact with them? What kind of devices are possible? Okay. So now to give you a, a look at what uh, might be possible, I'm going to rewind a little bit and back to a project that I did in collaboration uh, with my colleagues at Disney Research Pittsburgh back when that existed, particularly uh, a Lanson Sample, who was actually Josh Smith's PhD student, knows a ton about RF and wireless power, and yeah, he taught me what little I know about it. <laughs> Uh, he knows a lot. So we did an interesting project there and there's a nice demo video here with typical high uh, production values from Disney that shows you what's possible. And these are done with like RFID off the shelf RFID tags with an embedded antenna and RFID circuit. We print antennas using silver nanoparticle inks from an inkjet printer and add a small sticker with the RFID IC. Similar to the printed tags, a conductive ink pen is used to trace custom tags through a stencil. A pen can also be used to draw freehand <laughs> antennas. These are combined together to make a palette of RFID interaction primitives that can be used as building blocks for end applications. We sense seven different basic interaction methods, including covering, touching, sliding, turning, swiping, tag movement, and hand waving. This pop-up book triggers sound effects from a nearby computer when the page is opened and when the wheel is rotated to different positions. In this application, a single sheet of paper can be rolled into a conductor's wand and the user can control the rhythm of the music. A tag on a pinwheel acts as a wind speed sensor and can be coupled with on-screen animations like these particles. In the dollhouse, a single button tag triggers the doorbell. The slider controls the lights in the different rooms. Here we show a lamp being controlled by RFID tag interactions. In this classroom polling application, students can answer questions live during class with buttons embedded in the same worksheet they are writing on. All right, so that gives you a good idea of sort of a vocabulary of things. Uh, use, no, no. There we go. We use sticker like. There. Uh, yes? How does the waving thing work? There are two tags, and we look at the differential signal strength uh, between uh, the return from those two tags. Uh, and then there's a bit of mach simple machine learning underneath that to look for that particular interaction. Um, so how is that, so tag is completing an electronic circuit? Um, okay, so the tag is talking to a reader off screen, not shown, $500. Uh, <laughs> uh, not, not quite that much, but it's an expensive thing, which is why I talked a little bit about ambient backscatter. But uh, there's a reader off screen, which is uh, introducing RF uh, and uh, inducing enough power in the tag that it basically can Manip, uh, do electronic manipulation of its antenna and basically turn, turn um, absorption high and low of that antenna. And if you think about like high or low, that's going to get you one, and you can sense that from the reader, uh, that's going to get you one bit. And then you build a huge protocol on top of I can, I can transmit one bit. The reader is not on the screen, is not shown, it's off to the side. But, we, but the readers that we were using here in the uh, these are ultra-high frequency tags, have a uh, three, uh, 
practical, you can definitely do three meter uh, reading. So you could put it up at the ceiling uh, and sort of look down. Sometimes we put it under the table or we just sit it off to the side. And where is the transmission? Where is the, tra it's coming from the reader. The, so I'm sorry, say it again. So, so what does the silver tag do there? Uh, it communicates back an identification. And so one of the things that's happening is we are, if you put your finger on things, that may be causing a tag to either start or stop operating. And so it will start or stop um, producing its identification to the reader. And then we can translate all of that into, we know which tags are in which piece of the device, and we can translate all that all into uh, user interface actions. Alright, All right, so there is a fairly, going back to the high level here, there is a fairly simple classical lesson here, which is new technology, RFID tags actually are not that new, but the ambient backscatter might be, yeah. The hand basically, um, uh, the right way to think about it is interfering with the level of signal that you get between the reader and the tag, and so, and one of the things I can read is not just the ID, but I can read an RSS, uh, which is received signal strength, and I can see that going up and down in a systematic way, and if I've got two of them, I can compare them. So the transmitter is also the receiver? Yes, the, the reader um, sends and also senses how much of the RF energy that it is sending gets absorbed by the tag versus scattered somewhere else. So the tag's reflecting the... Uh, yeah, but it's better to think about it in an absorption because reflection goes in all sorts of directions. Uh, the absorption is. Since it's, it's the receiver that's um, seeing the. Yes, the, receiver the is reader, the, what I'm calling it. Right? Yeah, the, you, the reader both sends, and, sends an RF signal and senses how much of that signal it has been absorbed by the world versus reflected back. Yeah. Okay, so simple classic lesson here, which is new technology uh, or existing technology pushed in new directions is what we really have here, can push the boundaries of problems that we used to be working on in new and interesting ways. This is something that in the WISC community is like bread and butter. We're constantly looking for new technology which allows us to solve old problems, okay? And so this is new solutions to old problems. So now I want to go to exemplar number three, and here I want to talk about going beyond the UBCOMP notion of colonizing the world with computation, and I want to talk about a new capability of actually making the world with computation. Uh, and this is probably what I'm most excited about from research directions these days, which is new digital manufacturing uh, capabilities. 3D printing is the one of these that is probably most common in people's minds. Okay, um, these are starting to make it possible to fabricate a really wide range of objects based on things that we design in the virtual world. So we can think of a design, we can draw it on the screen, but purely virtually, we push a button and it appears. Well, it's never that simple as somebody who 3D prints all the time. It's not just pressing a button, but there is a path to get me from my computational representation to an actualized physical object. The shape of the silver print, what does that have to do with the receiving? Um, it's gonna, it's gonna change, the, the silver shape is an antenna, and you're gonna change the, an, the antenna's properties. Most, most of the time we're talking about shifting the resonant frequency. Um, and so the shape there is designed to resonate at a particular frequency. The tag wants to work at a particular frequency. If you shift the operation of the antenna away from that resonant frequency, it doesn't work anymore and the ID disappears. So that's one way in that, that we manipulate it. But that's what the shape matters because it changes the resonant frequency of the antenna. And so manipulating that shape, like adding a new piece to it, uh, will change its resonant frequency and change whether it reports or not. All right, so lots of folks, including me, uh, are working on new types of materials and printers, okay? Doing all sorts of interesting new stuff. 
Uh, there is a lot of really interesting work to do there. Uh, lots of interesting things we can do now. Uh, and there's a tremendous growth in what we can print. And in fact, my favorite is down at the bottom here. This is uh, Adam Feinberg's at CMU's work. Uh, this is a 3D printed uh, piece of collagen that is the sort of the scaffolding for a human heart valve. You can basically populate this with cells. Uh, and so it's 3D printing of a human heart. That's one of the things, and that's what Adam's real goal is. And I have to say that, you know, the best and coolest thing I could possibly think to print is spare parts for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I would say that in addition to this sort of expansion of what we can do these days, um, there's much more potential advance by taking a, a very classic HCI approach, and that is to enable a much wider set of users to make use of a very powerful technology. Okay, and we can see this from the past, from a lesson uh, that was a very major success, which is desktop publishing. Okay, and we don't really use that word very much anymore, but. Uh, very old fashioned, but a lot of modern graphical user interfaces really came out of solving this problem or producing this thing, which was desktop publishing. All right, so once upon a time, creating a high quality document was the domain of sheer, exclusive domain of a certain set of professionals, typesetters, uh, book designers, that sort of stuff. Okay, and desktop publishing came along and changed that. It made it so everybody can produce reasonably high quality documents, all right? But much more importantly than our ability to produce documents was really all of the things that came with that that were unimagined. So the goal was to be able to make it so we could produce documents. That's what Xerox PARC was trying to do with the uh, star and the precursors to that. <clears throat> But what was really interesting was all the stuff that happened as a result of that capability. A lot, a lot of what we see sort of on our desktop today, and which is going again migrated to our phones and tablets, came out of the solution to that problem. But it was not completely expected. And definitely the details of that were not what was necessarily expected, okay? And we are in, I feel like we're in a similar situation today or we can see an analogy. So the technology is there and it's affordable. For 200 bucks you can buy a printer, a 3D printer that will print quite well. Um, actually it prints as good as the printer we had bought sort of uh, maybe a decade before that that cost $30,000. But the problem is that the design of functional objects, if you go to functional objects as opposed to like um, baby Yoda's, um, requires a lot of skill, all right? Uh, and it requires a lot of skill in different areas, including 3D modeling, but it goes well beyond that. Uh, you need a lot of knowledge of materials, strength of materials, um, mechanical design, uh, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, which we can boil down to something called an engineering degree, okay? Um, or something similar, all right? So this makes all of this, uh, making this more accessible to a wider set of folks, um, makes this an HCI problem, okay? I think some people have questions whether fabrication is an HCI problem, it's an HCI problem. <laughs> Okay, really doing what we want to do. So if we can abstract and encapsulate these capabilities, we can produce a revolution uh, in making of things, which I think can parallel the kind of revolution that we saw in desktop publishing, uh, because really we're talking about much more capable things. It's not just stuff on paper anymore that we're gonna create, but it's physical objects, uh, much more functional. All right, so that's my pitch for why you should pay attention to that. Now, why does this have to do with Moore's Law, okay? Well, an important approach to making this happen is going to be in generative design, and in particular, interactive generative design. So we've seen a lot of work in generative design, but often it is sort of very batch-oriented. You sort of specify, and by the way, generative design, you're gonna specify what you want, but not how to achieve that, all the details of that. And we're gonna let the system produce the design, we're gonna let the system generate that. But a lot of current generative design is very essentially batch oriented. You say what you want, it produces a design, you take it or leave it, okay? 
Uh, if, you want, if you don't like it, you have to go back and change your description of what you wanted. Okay? You can't really interact with it. Okay? Now, a lot of uh, generative design gets done through optimization, and it turns out optimization is very capable of consuming every bit of CPU power that we can deliver to it today. But remember what's coming, okay? So uh, we are now starting to see enough computational power um, that uh, we can start to think about using this uh, in an interactive setting where the user really interacts with the process. Uh, which means we have to run at very fast rates. We have to run at interactive rates, not sort of in a batch setting. All right, so here's an example. This is from Anthony Chen's uh, dissertation work. Uh, so we're going to start with an example here. If we want to design this uh, leg on this quadruped robot, it needs to touch the ground here and have enough strength to hold that leg, and we're going to provide a force here. All right, and we're going to ha have a little simple tool. We're going to say, well, it kind of is going to be from here to here. We're going to have this much force here, and it's going to be touching the ground down here. Now, these are all interactive elements, so he's going to go in here and erase a little part of this while well, he's pointing to the operators, but we'll erase part of that, and then we'll put it back. Okay. Um, and then based on this sketch uh, and the loading scenario that's in this sketch, we're going to have the system generate, uh, and this, as we start here, we'll speed this up later, but this is now in real time. Uh, we're going to have the system generate uh, a design. So this is, if you know about this, this is topology optimization here. These are all going to end up being um, variations on topology optimization. And there are three kinds of variations on topology optimization. I just showed you one. Here's another one, which is uh, variations on the existing design. So you can see the user sort of gave part of it, and then the system comes along and says, you need to add this in order to meet those requirements that you have set up here. Um, and number three says, OK, stay within these bounds. So you maybe this uh, thing has to attach to something else, or it needs to not hit something. Uh, stay within these bounds. Uh, produce something that has very high strength to weight ratio is what we're basically looking for here. Okay. Now, there's also an interactive element, more interactive element to this. We can come along and say, well, I want this to be more similar to what I had before or less similar to what I've drawn. So this is a high similarity one. And we're going to just take that slider and say, well, OK, you, go, you can go a little further from what I said. And you'll see it produces a little bit different design that is further from what the user originally specified. And all of our designs are sort of the possible designs are, are stacked up there, and we can select them and so forth. OK? And you can also come in and edit and say, well, I don't want so much material here. And this isn't just like saying you can't put material here. This is really a hint to the system and the optimizer that I want less material there. I want less material there. And you can see it goes back and tries to do that. You can also come in and say, I want more material here. OK, so he's going to come in and draw, say, I think there should be material here. And the system really comes back and says, well, no, you don't really need that. <laughs> and, but then the user can come and say, yeah, really, I want more material there. And so the system comes back and says, all right, all right I'll put a little more material there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> OK, so these are really hints uh, to the system. They are not sort of commanding that it must be like this. So here's an example of a full use of this. Now, unfortunately, right now, computationally, we can only really do this in 2D. I think that's true of everybody. And, but we're going to do a bicycle seat here, OK? And 3D print that bicycle seat. And we're going to sit on it in a second here. There we go. All right. That's our demo bike that we have in the lab that we use for many different purposes. Um, OK, here's another example, which is we're going to make uh, legs. For, we're going to make a little table. OK, and we need strong uh, legs for that, but um, don't necessarily want them to just be solid. So here's the physical instantiation of that result uh, as a little table. All right, and lots of other things, but we're going to st stop at this point and move on. No, really, there we go. All right, so the lesson that I want to sort of bring forward uh, with this is that uh, the big win here is going to have come from empowering a lot of new people. This is a classic um, <clears throat> HCI theme applied to a new area, okay? empowering a set of people. And this will likely result uh, in a wide set of really great but really unexpected results, I think. All right. So let me wrap this up since I am, in fact, running late. Implications of all of this. 
How should you be thinking differently as an HCI researcher? Well, I think one of the ways in which you should be thinking differently is that you need to be think you are not thinking big enough with respect to how much computing power you can put into the interface in service of the user. We need to think bigger. Now, it's the case that order n cubed and worse algorithms are still not going to work. <laughs> okay, don't forget that, all right? But a lot of what we do does not fit in that. And our CS intuitions about efficiency are really getting us into trouble. They are leading us astray. All right. So I think you really want to think in terms uh, of just burning CPU cycles in, in service of the user, not for no reason at all, and not just burning them, because I'm a CS person. I don't want to be inefficient. <laughs> but we want to think about really a lot, applying a lot more computing power than we have. All right. Now, I'm almost done. Our HCI, I want to say that our, I don't want to just pick on my CS intuitions. I think our HCI intuitions are getting us into trouble too. Okay, and my favorite example of that is this here, which is a picture from Steve Feiner's Turing Project, 1997. All right, what do we have here? We have this person all sort of suited up in this getup. First off, we can look at this and say, is that usable? No, not even close. Um, but what do we got here? Well, uh, this sort of dome-shaped thing on the end of the pole is what you had to do for GPS at that point. Uh, there is a really big laptop strapped to that backpack. Uh, so we have mobile computation. There was a handheld display with input. This was pen input at that time, because uh, that's what we thought was going to be good, and that's what we had. Uh, and then there's this experimental wireless communication. What does all that put together make? Okay. Makes a smartphone, <laughs> all right? And so we need to remember that in order uh, for us to get that smartphone, we need to do this, <laughs> okay? To do the, we need to do that to get that. There's much more that we need to do, but we need to be able to do that. And that's not usable. So our HCI intuitions of, we need to take this out to the users and see if they can use it for the task, <laughs> okay? No. <laughs> All right. We need to be able to explore things before that. And so our sort of methodologies and our intuitions from HCI are also getting us into trouble. So I think there's a second order lesson here, which is our methodologies that we use for all sorts of things are very well evolved. Um, and they are evolved to suit the values and needs uh, of a particular context and a particular time. All right. Now, the fact of the matter is that because they are evolved, they serve that context and that time very well. But we need to keep in mind uh, that these tend to get passed on, not uh, sort of in a very um, considered way, but they get passed on as the right thing to do methodologically. You learn from your advisor as a PhD student the right way to do research. And that encapsulates a set of evolved methodologies that serve a particular set of values very well. And these also get passed on from reviewers to authors. Once you start authoring papers, you'll understand this. <laughs> um, but again, they get passed on as the right way to do things without a lot of examination. And I say that this uh, is getting us into trouble. Uh, and in particular gets us into trouble in an interdisciplinary setting where we have multiple possible sets of values, multiple possible contexts, multiple possible goals. HCI clearly is in, uh, in that setting. And especially when things are changing very fast. Uh, and my whole thought experiments around Moore's Law is pushing towards things are changing very fast. Okay, but most of all, I want you to come away remembering that you are here. All the cool and good stuff hasn't happened yet. All the big change is in front of you, it is not behind you. Okay, um, and with that, I am over time and we'll stop. I don't know what I should do about questions. First, let's clap. Oh. <laughs> Why don't we take one question from someone who hasn't spoken yet? Don't want to use up the one slot. <laughs> All right, go for it. Uh, he's going to hand you the mic. They're going to hand you mics. Thanks. Um, 
based on just uh, yeah. uh, based on just um, everything that's been discovered up till now, and just um, your personal experience of the research that you've done, um, what would you say like the biggest like like what would you say is the biggest um, advancement or where the world is going now in terms of just um, technology, human interaction. Okay, well, I won't roll my slides back, but remember at the beginning I said I'm not making predictions. <laughs> okay, but. Slides are not, so you can make predictions. Yeah, but, but, but I will go ahead and make the prediction. Uh, okay, I'm, you know, I'm just gonna make the personal prediction. What, I'll change your question into like, what am I working on? What do I think? What am I putting, you know, I've only got one of me. What am I putting that resource on? And right now it is fabrication. Um, there, there's a bunch of interesting things I think we can do with new computational fabrication techniques. I don't believe that's the answer to that question, but it's the answer that I use for myself uh, for the most part right now. Now the truth of the matter is I work on all sorts of different things and I'm interested in working on all sorts of things. I don't really believe a lot in planning of research, less so than other people. Um, so anyway, that's my answer. Take it or leave it. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, Scott. Thank you.